All right, let's, um, let's get into our, our next series here called Living Forward. Uh, we live in, uh, you know, at this, this church, this congregation. We have two congregations. We have our Chinese congregation in the afternoons, and this is uh, our expat, English congregation. And so most of us are from somewhere else. How many of you have traveled in and out of Taiwan in the past year? Who's, who's been in and out of Taiwan in the past year? Anybody? Okay. So probably uh, a good third of, of the congregation. How many of you have moved here to Taiwan in the past five years? How many of you have moved here in the past five years? Okay. So probably like half the congregation. Um, so we're used to traveling. Uh, we're, we're people who, who understand traveling and the difficulty. My wife actually is flying out uh, this, this evening, uh, going to New Zealand to be with her family uh, this evening. And so you know, we're, we're getting all the different uh, travel documents together, and she's, her flight is going through Australia, and so now Australia has a new thing where you have to get a, an ETA, and, and so, you know, she's getting her passports and her ARC and, and, and photos and all these things to prove that she is who she is. If all your, your documents don't align, it doesn't matter how much you think you are who you are. They're going to say, no, you aren't, and you're not getting on the flight. You know, it's, it's such a hassle, right, these days, traveling, all the documentation. I don't know if any of you have ever had that, those kind of problems. You get to the airport, forgot my passport, not going anywhere, you know, um, or, or your visa is a little, a, a little off, or they misspelled your name. That, but that's really my name, and here, look at it, and say, no, you can't fly. Your ticket's different from your passport. Uh, and, and so traveling is just becoming such a hassle because Officials want to know, are you really who you say you are, right? And, and we think, oh, of course I am. I remember the first time that they started, you know, they ha- I, I was traveling and had to do all this stuff with driver's license and things. I'd say, can't they just believe me? Who else am I going to be? Of course I'm me, you know? And then all of a sudden, we start hearing about this new thing called identity theft. And this year, just in the United States, this year, just one category of identity theft, taxed. Guys who, who make up a, uh, take someone else's identity and file for a return, turn in a false tax return. Over $6 billion worth of fraud just in taxes this year. And that was as of March. So we don't even know the rest of April. Most everybody's going to April 15th to turn in their taxes, you know. So already six bi- over $6 billion worth of fraud, over a million people who were stealing other people's identity. And, and that's just this year alone. That's been going on for years now. And so we see how um, identity theft is a huge problem. People have gone to jail because other people have committed crimes and then given false identity. In so many ways, this identity theft, it, it, it uh, destroys. So you have these two kind of uh, balancing things as we travel. We're, we're, we want to get all our documentation, and it's such a hassle. But on the other side, we want to make sure that our identity is, is safe. Really what it is in the end is it used to not be this way. But after 9-11, everything changed in how we travel. I can remember growing up, just, you know, you walk out to the plane, right? And, you, and if I have a ticket and I don't want to fly that day, I give it to my friend. He said, you want to fly? You want to get on this flight? Sure. You know, like he takes a ticket, jumps on the plane. But it's not that way anymore, is it? And see, as society, as it begins to break down, as, as sin, as, as people do, do evil, do wickedness. It affects all of us. And it affects the ease of life. It affects our identity, our ability to be who we say we are, or ability to others to trust that we are who we say we are. And it's never what God intended, because actually God intended us for us to travel freely. In fact, we as, as, as Christians, what the Bible teaches is that we are travelers. Our whole life is actually a journey here on earth. And we're meant to embrace this journey and for it to be more of an adventure and less of a pain. How many of you like traveling? Anybody like traveling? If you're an expat living in in Taiwan, we hope you like traveling because you got to travel, right? But most of us like traveling because we were made to travel. And so this series, Living Forward, is actually all about how does... How does travel and and what the Bible says about this journey of life, what are the principles that we can get from from the Bible? As we look at different men and women in Scripture who went on these journeys and how it shaped and affected both their identity and their destiny. And then we'll also have personal testimonies, people sharing of how their journey in life has shaped and molded them and helped them discover their identity 
and begin to align with their destiny. Because each and every one of us actually has a created destiny in life. An intention that God has for your life. And an identity that he created you for. But we actually discover this identity through our journeys with God and through this adventure called life. And so living forward is, is learning to, to see life through, the, through a biblical perspective, how life is a grand adventure. And, and this journey that we're on shapes and molds us and begins to, if we respond correctly to the journey, and if we see the journey uh, the way that God intends, it'll begin to, to we'll discover the, the true identity for which we were created and the destiny, the purpose uh, for which we were put on earth. And so let's, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into it. We'll get into the scripture, begin to unpack the principles of journeying with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, are so thankful for this gift called life and the journey, the adventures that you take us on. I pray, Lord God, that over these next weeks, this, this summer, as we look into this, um, this perspective and, and this principle of life being a journey, that, Father, you'll begin to speak to us, shape and mold our, our values and our perspectives in a way that we would truly begin to understand the identity for which you created us and the purpose for which you placed us here on earth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here we go. Our scripture for this whole series is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. So I'm just going to read that. Uh, let's see. It says here, your life is a journey. You must travel with a deep consciousness of God. And that's pretty much sums up what this series is about. It costs God plenty to get you out of the dead end, dead end, empty-headed life you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood. You know, he died like an unblemished sacrificial lamb. And this was no afterthought, even though it has only, uh, it, it has only lately at the end of the ages become public knowledge, God always knew he was going to do this for you. It's because of his sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, that you trust God and that you know you have a future in God. And so what we're looking at today, just kind of an overview of, the, of today's sermon, is we're looking really at, at Jesus, because he's always the one who we first want to look at. And we'll look at his very first solo journey. It was times he traveled as a kid, uh, but this is Jesus' first solo journey. And, and, and then we're going to talk about what is it in, in our lives how do we secure our identity? Okay, so that's a, a quick overview uh, of today's sermon. So we're looking in Matthew. For those of you who, if you have your Bible, there you go. There's a, the overview. We're looking in Matthew chapter 3, starting in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And we'll go to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 4. And it says this about Jesus. After his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water. The heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. Now, I'm not sure what that looked like at that time, you know, but uh, I, I was, um, ha we were having lunch yesterday with uh, Manny and Angela. Some of you know Manny and Angela. I'm not sure if they're, they're here today, but they're talking about how um, they're walking around the city and, and um, up, in this, up in this tree, they saw this bird that was, that was, was, was crying. And, uh, and as he walked and shopped around, that bird just stayed there. And then uh, uh, Angela went into a, stop, into a shop, came out, and the bird was right above the shop and the bird came flew down and landed on her head <laughs> and and then so she put her hand up and the bird crawled on her hand and and then so then she she went home took the bird home and the bird has been with them ever since <laughs> <laughs> and she's showing those little videos of this bird how it hops on her shoulder and it just keeps giving her little you know little love kisses and, and it was just like uh, that's that's an unusual bird, you know. Uh, um, but but I, I don't know if that's what it was like, you know, when, when Jesus came up out of the waters and and in his baptism. I do remember we were baptizing a, a in um, a guy in in L.A. He was from our church in New York and had just come to know Christ. 
And so we're, we, he came with us to L.A. We're at a conference there. Uh, he's, he's a, a businessman, president of a, a big Japanese corp- company, but radically uh, came to know Jesus. And so he wanted to get baptized. So L.A., they're baptizing him uh, in the pool there. And as he comes up out of the water, these doves come down. You know, they fly. They don't land on him, but, but they, come, they, they fly over him. And he's like, that's like the Bible, you know, and he, and he was just so amazed at that, you know, and, and just kind of his life is doing these radical moments, uh, and so he says, ah, it's just like Jesus when he got, got baptized, uh, and then, then the Bible says another thing happened, a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And so I don't know if that was, uh, if God spoke like in a booming voice or how that happened, but this voice came from heaven and declared that Jesus, before he had done any ministry, God the Father said, this is my love son who brings me great joy. What an awesome thing to hear from your father, right? You're my love, beloved son who brings me great joy. And, and I can remember just growing up with a you know, Chinese dad and who uh, at, at first was, was not as vocal. But over the years, as, as he came to know Christ and, and just began to see what fatherhood looked like from, from Scripture, more and more he would just begin to, to, to uh, voice out his love and, and voice out his care for, for me and for the, the rest of my siblings. Uh, and there's just something about the father's voice when you get that affirmation and that expression of love that transforms us. And so this is what Jesus experienced. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. And and, and so Jesus here, his first solo journey, led by the Holy Spirit, the comforter. God gave the Holy Spirit to comfort us. But instead, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the desert. I don't know about you, but the desert is, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not a great place to be. And, and the Bible says that he was there to be tempted by the devil. And so the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the devil to be tempted. I don't know about you, but that's kind of not my picture of what God does in my life and what I want the Holy Spirit to do for me. I, I never pray that. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. But here the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus into temptation. And then for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and he became very hungry. Well, duh, you know, 40 days of not eating. Uh, I don't know if you ever fasted 40 days, but uh, actually you don't get hungry. Uh, you, you get hungry the first few days and then you get hungry the last couple of days, you know. And the last couple of days you start thinking about food. But in between, it's really your, your body starts to forget being hungry, you know. And you start eating actually the junks that are in your body. So you can get very sick if you've had a bad um, diet. Uh, but then, then at the end, you start thinking about food again. Um, so I, but here it says that Jesus became very hungry. And, and during that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. And so here the enemy comes in with this question. If you're the son of God. And he questions Jesus' identity. And what we're going to discover is that The enemy always is questioning our identity. And what he wants to do is shake our identity, destroy our identity, and come and attack us at the very core of who we are. And we find that happens throughout our lives. That this is something that we all experience in life. Whether it's through the voices of people around us or the experiences that we have, every single one of us has moments when our identity is attacked and we struggle to, to, what is my identity? And people come and they bully us or experiences happen, crises, drama happens in our life that makes us begin to question or wonder. We begin to to fight for identity. So this is what Jesus underwent and this is what all of us undergo in our lives is this battle for identity. And the enemy does it by beginning to question our identity. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so here's something we see is that the enemy, just like the enemy came and questioned Jesus and began to attack his identity, the enemy will come and begin to bring doubts and questions into every single one of our lives. And when the enemy asks questions in our lives, and usually it sounds like our own thoughts, but sometimes it sounds like others' voices whether a coworker, a boss, a classmate, uh, a mom or dad, a brother or sister, just beginning to tear you down. I don't know if you ever heard any of those voices. Just questioning who you are, questioning your competency. 
questioning your ability, questioning your worth. These are all, this is what the enemy does through his questions. Because his questions always come to, to bring deception and confusion into our lives or to bring unbelief and doubt into our lives. And two of the main things he wants us to doubt is who we are. Who God's made us to be. Because the Bible says that we're created in the image of God. And the enemy will always try to make us doubt our identity. And the second thing he always tries to, to, to make us doubt is what God thinks about us. Because the Bible very clearly says that God loves us. That God created us for good. That his thoughts towards us every morning are new and they're good. God's intentions towards us are always good. But the enemy will always come in and try to get us to doubt our identity, who we think we are, and get us to doubt who God says we are. It's interesting that, that the enemy used the same questions against Jesus, the same questions against Adam and Eve in the garden. The very first thing that when the enemy came, Genesis chapter 3, the very first thing that, that the enemy tempted Adam and Eve in was, was actually not to eat the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The first thing he did was he got them to the question and says, did God really say? So what he wanted to, them to really doubt was, what did God really say? What did God really say about you? What does God really say about the world you live in? Can you trust that? The enemy is always going to try to attack that. It's interesting that right after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, fell in sin, disobeyed God, rejected God, as being God in their lives and said, we can be God for ourselves. We can figure out for ourselves, right and wrong. We can become like God without him. Which sounds very much like when, when you, when you look, read through the scriptures and it talks about Lucifer who is Satan. And when he rebelled against God, he said the same thing. I'm going to make myself like God. I'm going to be just like God. And so now he's getting Adam and Eve to have that same thought. And we see that in the culture all around today is now, there's, you know, what's important is me, my opinion. I'm, I'm going to be my own God, make my own way. But when God came to Adam and Eve, he also, first thing he did was ask him. He said, um, Adam and Eve, he said, hey, where are you? Because Adam and Eve hid themselves because they were ashamed. And so often when we struggle with identity, the first thing we do is we, we get into shame. We, we begin to hide, cover ourselves. So Adam and Eve hid. And God says, where are you? It's not because God didn't know where they were. You know, so he wasn't like, oh, I wonder where they went. You know, it's like, like little kids, right? You ever play hide and seek and you see them hiding there. Where's Johnny? You know, where did he go? And they're, they're laughing, you know, they can't keep themselves from laughing, you know. God knew exactly where they were. But he wants us to begin to understand where we are. See, when God asks a question of us, his, his goal is to help us to bring understanding, clarity to our circumstance and our situation. And from there to begin to build our faith and our trust in him. That's why God asks questions. God never asks a question except he already has an answer for you that's going to help you. The enemy always asks questions in order to try to destroy us. God asks questions in order to build us up in our lives. And so today we're, we're going we're to look at um, how, how Jesus then responded. He says, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus said, I only say what I, I hear the Father saying. And so our, God's intention for us is that we would live this life with an ear to hear what God's Spirit is saying to us. Because we have all these voices in our lives, our own voices and voices of those around us, the voices of the culture, the voices of our family, friends, co-workers. But Jesus lived by listening to God's voice. And that was God's intention with Adam and Eve and God's intention for us is that we learn to listen to God's voice, God's words. The scripture goes on, Satan continues to tempt Jesus. But every time that Satan tempts Jesus, here's his next response. He says uh, in verse 7, it says, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. So, so Jesus then begins to quote scripture. Verse 10, he says, Get out of here, Satan. The scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. And sometimes when you, when you recognize the voice of the enemy bringing confusion to your life, 
when you start to feel confused, when you start to feel uh, destroyed in your life, when, when that, those voices begin to, um, be, begin to make you feel bullied, make you feel condemned, then you can recognize that that's the voice of the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus just said, Satan, get out of here. And sometimes in our lives, we have to do that. Shut up, Satan. Get out of here. And then he said, this is what the scriptures say. And that's why we read the word, because the word, as we begin to read the word, it makes us, number one, helps us hear God better, but it also gives us an answer to the, the lies and the deception and the destruction that the enemy wants to bring into our lives. So that's why we encourage you, you know, read the Bible. As we're going through this, um, this series, we're going to be looking at different lives in the Bible. One of them we're going to look at is, is Abraham. And this past week, we have our, our daily reading. That is a church we're all reading together. If you're not doing that, I encourage you to jump on that. And it was one of the readings, I think it was back Wednesday or Thursday, was Genesis chapter 12. And where, where Abraham, God said, hey, Abraham, leave your father and mother. Get on a journey. Because in this journey, you're going to discover who you are. You may be leaving your family, but you're going to become a blessing to every family. And in our journeys with God, we discover purpose. And in our journeys with God, we discover identity. And so that's, that's why we get into the Word of God. We start to study these lives because it begins to teach us how to, how to go on this journey of life with God. In fact, there's a, a recent study they surveyed uh, 40,000 people, ages 8 to 80. And, and just on how, how often do you read the Bible and what effect does it have in your life? And so after doing this survey, here's what they found is that people who read the Bible zero to three times uh, a week, um, they find a very little change, especially the zero to one to two times a week, uh, 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 negligible change. A little bit of change if you read it three times a week. But if you read the Bible four times a week, people who read the Bible four times a week or more, drastic, radical change in their lives. The feeling of loneliness drops 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Uh, sex outside of marriage, cheating on your wife, drops 68%. Oh, cheating on your husband as well. Drops 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sharing your faith with others like, like Pastor Hope did jumps up 200%. Discipling others, which is helping others come to, to grow in their faith in Christ, 230%. So radical change happens in our lives as we begin to get into the Word of God because the Word of God is what helps us combat the lives of the enemy. This is what Jesus did. And so as we watch Jesus in His journey, this is what He did. His first solo journey was led right into Temptation from the enemy. But how he confronted that temptation was the word of God. What does God say? You can feed me these lies. You can try to destroy my identity. But I'm going to go back to the word of God because that's where I find my true identity. You know, it's interesting when, when, uh, when someone steals your identity, they have certain steps that you take when, when you're a victim of identity theft. And here's four steps. Number one, recognize or, or detect. So the first thing is pay attention and detect when someone is stealing your identity. So in other words, check your bank accounts, check your credit cards, that kind of thing. Detect when, that, when, when issues like that are happening in your life. And it's kind of like spiritually. You got to detect when the enemy is destroying your identity. And how do you do that? You have to know what, it was supposed, what your life is supposed to be. And then you can tell when it's being stolen. If you don't know what's supposed to be in your bank account, then how do you know if anything's being stolen? You don't. But that's what the Word of God does. It says, here's what life is supposed to look like. And now you can measure and say, is the, am I allowing the enemy to steal from that identity? So recognize. The second thing, reach out. So when you recognize that, man, I think someone might be trying to steal my identity, you begin to reach out. You reach out to the authorities. You call the police. Call your bank, you know, be, call your credit card companies. You start to reach out to people for help to stop this. And that's what prayer is. And that's what fellowship is. 
when you think that someone's starting to steal your identity, I'm starting to feel bad about myself. I'm starting to feel shamed, condemned, insecure, losing hope, losing joy, losing trust and faith in my life. What do we do? We reach out. We go to the place of prayer. We begin to get around others who are going to encourage us and encourage that identity in Christ. And then you take steps to repair. You repair it. You, you find out which accounts have been uh, compromised. And you find out if they've opened up accounts that are a false identity. It's not really me. That credit card is, I didn't, I didn't get that card. That's not really me. And that's what we call repentance. Repentance is when we see error in our lives, when we th- see areas of destruction in our lives, we turn, we change. We say, close that down. That's not me. Close that account down. That's when the enemy got into, and he's using it to hurt me and to hurt other people. If you repent of those things, whenever you see the enemy coming in and destroying you or others, you repent of that. See, you and I, we weren't created to be selfish people. We weren't created to be angry people. We weren't created to be bullying people. We weren't created to be fearful, insecure people. And when we see these things start coming into our lives, you say, that's not my identity. That one, that doesn't belong to me. So we begin to repair. And then you set up, you, you protect yourself. You set up ways to repel the enemy. You set up regular checks and on your different accounts and things. You put in um, you know, protections. Same in our lives. The Bible gives us spiritual armor and the word of God it protects us. Our faith, our trust in God's promises protects us. See, God has an identity for you. But the enemy always and, and the world around us wants to give us false identity. And, and we, all have, we all have someplace that, that we look to to form our identity. And so here's some of the, the common pl- sources of identity. One is community and traditions. We have family. So within the family, I'm a brother, I'm a sister, I'm a, a son or a father. And so our identity is formed by the community, the people we live with and, and live around. And, and we, we, we just step into the identity that the community gives us. There's identity that comes from our environment and experiences in our lives. And... Sometimes we, that's, that's where we look for our source. I, I, don't, I love the sound of music and, and the, that, the famous song, Climb Every Mountain, you know, climb every mountain, right? And, it, and, you know, afford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. Honestly, that's saying, I'm going to find my identity by my experiences. I, I can tell you that experience is not a great teacher. Wisdom is a much better teacher. I don't want to just learn not to touch a hot stove by touching a hot stove. I want to listen to someone say, don't touch the hot stove and just have some wisdom. Say, I'm not going to touch the hot stove, you know. Turn off the saw when you're, you know, and keep your fingers away from the saw. I want to learn that by wisdom, not by experience. Oh, you know, missing a hand, I got experience. Now I'm smarter, you know. (laughs) Experience teaches us, but it's not the best teacher. Our environment, environment can teach you, but environment can also be a very harsh schoolmaster. We talk about the guy who was climbing the boulders, got his arm stuck and had to just cut off his arm to get out. The environment can be a very, very tough place to learn identity. Some of us, we get our identity, we look for it in accomplishments and accolades. That's also, it's kind of a, that, uh, what do they call this, a two-edged sword. If, I, if I'm good at it and get accomplishments and accolades, then... I get proud and I become insufferable person I don't want to be around and I think I'm so full of myself. And then I got to keep that up and kind of keep growing it so I don't just live off of less, yesterday's accolades and because people always forget what you did for me yesterday. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, you were MVP last year, but what about this year? Replaced by the latest model. It's a harsh way of getting an holding on to identity. And then if I don't get good accomplishments and accolades, then I'm a failure, you know, and I'm, I'm marked by that. So it's kind of like a, whether if I, you know, it, it, whether I do well or I, I do poorly, it, either way, it's not a source of joy in my life. The last, the most popular one in, in contemporary culture, at least in Western culture, is self. Look to yourself. Who do you think you are? How do you feel about yourself? Create your own identity for yourself. 
And that's, you know, that song that was kind of ringing in our brains for years, uh, last few years, um, Let It Go. <laughs> Frozen, you know, movie uh, identity by movies, you know, let it go, let it go, you know, and and, and uh, the, uh, my my wife would know all the words, and so would all my nieces, but I don't. But I but here here I have it written down. It says, I don't care what they're gonna say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. I don't care what people think. I don't care what the, about the environment. You know, I just me. I'm gonna make up who I am, right? Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small. The fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do. The test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. It's just a song about just me. You know, it's just I'm going to determine who I am. Decide for myself. And these are all sources of identity, but they're all harsh sources of identity that lead to sadness in our lives and lead and suck the joy, honestly, out of our lives. They suck the, the adventure out of our lives. God's intention is that he would be the one from whom we get our identity. That's what the Bible says, I, I, to find our identity in Christ. Really smart guy who's um, Blaise Pascal. He was a mathematician, scientist, philosopher. Uh, he said this. He, he's a guy who, if you love game theory, uh, you can blame him. Yeah, he was one of the early founders of game theory. If you hated probability and statistics in school, you can also blame him. He's one of the early guys who, who set the, the theories of probability, uh, helped us understand uh, vacuums and stuff like that. He, he was just a really brilliant guy. Um, and then he be became a Christian and started to become a philosopher. And he said, not only do we know God by Jesus Christ alone, but we know ourselves only by Jesus Christ. We know life and death only through Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we do not know what is our life, nor our death, nor our God, nor ourselves. Amen. And so he says, you know, that's where, that's where identity is meant to come from. That's where we're supposed to source our identity. Why? Because he made us. So he knows us. And he loves us more than we love ourselves. And he's seen from the beginning to the end of our lives. And so he can guide us into the, the best destiny for our lives. But you have to trust him. And that's why faith is so important. So how do we secure our identity? Quick passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Scripture says, You are not like that, for you are a chosen people royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. I think we can jump there. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners, in other words, you were on a journey, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Verse 12. Do we have verse 12? Is that where we end? Nope, that's where we ended. All right. So five identity, five sources of identity through Christ. These are like the five fingerprints that help you understand who you are in Christ. Number one, we're chosen. Okay, so verse 9 says, you are a chosen people. What does that mean? That means God sees you. You ever felt unseen, unappreciated, unaccepted? That's soul destroying when you start to feel that way. And that's why God says you have to know that you not only are seen, you're chosen. I think sometimes it's even worse to be seen and not chosen. Right? Oh, the last guy chosen for the basketball team. But the Bible says, you're chosen. God chooses you. I believe you're not here today by accident. I believe God chose you. And you, you're here because God wants you to know that you are chosen personally and specifically by God. And if it helps you to hear that, then turn to someone next to you and tell them, you're chosen. And have them tell you back, you're chosen. Just so, you know... <laughs> Sometimes it's good just to hear it in the flesh, right? It's a biblical truth. But the reason why we fellowship and come together on times like this, sometimes we just have to hear it repeated. You know, there's a principle um, in, in, in science uh, discovered in 19, I think it was actually fairly recently, 
in the past 20, 30 years. And, and it's this thing that the more you hear something repeated, the more likely you are to believe it. I forget what the scientific name for that is. Someone can, can keep repeating to you something that you actually logically know is false. But if you hear it enough, you begin to believe it. People who do marketing, they understand that. People who do politics understand this. You just keep saying the same thing over and over again. You ever seen politicians get up and they ask them a question? They don't answer the question at all. They just say what they want, that, that thing they're going to say. And they're going to say it over and over. Every chance they get, they're going to repeat the same thing over and over again. And because they know that if you hear the same message enough, you'll start to believe it. And that's the power of social media. If we see a thing, this, what they used to call echo chambers, if you hear something repeated often enough, it doesn't matter whether you agree or think it makes sense. If you hear it often enough, you, you, something in our brain begins to kick in and we start to believe it. And that's why the Bible says we're, we need to stay in the Word. That's why reading the Scriptures four times a week. And the Bible says if you meditate on the Word of God, it'll begin to change you and you'll begin to live the life that God intended. You'll begin to find the, the kind of success in life that God intended. Not the kind of success that fills your bank account and empties your soul, but the kind of success that brings joy to you and the people around you. That brings a sense of satisfaction regardless of what's in your bank account. That brings a sense of accomplishment because you know your life is on track. Living the destiny that God created you for. And you know that God's got you. And therefore, life becomes an adventure. Why? Because you know that God has your future planned out for you and you know that you're tracking with Him. That's the power of being in the Word. That's the power of being chosen. God wants you to be chosen like, like that little bird that landed on Angela. It chose her. You know? And now it just loves her and sticks with her. Um, the second, we're royal priests. Verse 9. And that talks about family and function. Royalty. You're born into royalty. And there's privileges but also responsibilities. There's, you know, incredible wealth for every, anybody who gets into the royal family of England. And royal family of Brunei. And these other families. You, you're, born into, you're born to it. You don't have to earn it. You're born into it. But because you're born into it, then it comes with responsibilities. There's a function. And for us, we function not only as being royalty, but also as priests. We have a responsibility for how we conduct ourselves. And we're meant to be people who, what a priest does is he's, he's in that place between God and men. He brings the requests and the needs and the brokenness of people to God. And then he brings the responses of God and the love of God and the care of God to people. And that's what God's calling is for us. That's our identity. We're a holy nation. In other words, we're set apart. We're, we're, we're a people that, uh, holy just means set apart, consecrated. You're chosen for a certain specific place and purpose. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 says, You are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. So it says chosen, you're, you're, you're taken out of the drawer with everybody else and you're put in a special place. Number four, you're God's very own possession. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 9. God owns you. And, and actually, your worth is determined by who owns you, who paid for you. God sent His only Son. He paid an unmeasurable cost for you, and that determines your worth. People say, well, how much is a house worth? Well, it's worth exactly what people are willing to pay for it. No more, no less. I don't care what the real estate guy says. If no one's going to pay you, he can say, you know, it's worth, you know, $5 million. But if people only say, I'll pay you 500000 guess what it's worth? 500000 because that's all, that's all that people give for you. So what God gave for you is really what determines your wealth. It doesn't matter what anyone else's opinion is, even your own. Your true worth is based on what God was willing to pay for you. It's also determined by who owns you. In other words, you know, it, I, I got these sketcher shoes on, and I could try to put them on eBay, and someone might give me a buck for them. But if I said these sketchers, you know, were owned by LeBron James, and he wore them, you know, in the championship game, game whatever, you know, guess what? All of a sudden, the value goes, right? Because the value is not determined by the shoe itself, but by who owns it. 
famous base, you know, the, you, you can get just, I, I can get a baseball off the shelf, but if I get baseball that was hit by Babe Ruth, I might get an old piece of paper that's worth nothing. But if it was owned by George Washington and he wrote the letter, guess what? So who are we owned by? Who wrote the story of our lives? That's what determines our worth. You are God's people. Uh, reading uh, this week from Jeremiah 31, in our daily reading, it says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. God loves us. And, and the last thing is you're someone who's received God's mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. So no matter how much you mess up, because you and I, we're all going to mess up. But the Bible says we are recipients of God's mercy. So we're not defined by our worst moments. We're defined by God's mercy. We're defined by his ownership. We're defined by what he paid for us. And this is what you need to begin to fill your heart and mind with because the enemy and the world around you will always try to get you to devalue yourself. And then they can take advantage of you. And then you live a life with insecurity and, and just trying to get ahead you know, and, and you'll spend, you know, uh, more money than you have on being seen in the right clothes, at the right places, eating the right food, traveling to the right destinations. Why? All because of other people's opinions. Because your identity has been placed in the wrong things. When you let God determine our identity, everything changes. And you don't know who you are without Jesus. Not who you're truly meant to be. You can take on a lot of false identities, a lot of stolen identities, but you can't discover your true identity without Christ. Isaiah 43 verse 25 says, Yet I am the God who forgives your sins. And I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. The Bible says that God, who is so rich in mercy, sent Jesus to die in our place for our sins. Ephesians 1.7 says this, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. If you felt trapped in your life, like you just can't get past certain brokenness, certain circumstances in your life. God wants to set you free. If you look back in your life and there's shame or there's guilt from the things that you've done, God wants to know that you are forgiven of your sins. You can be forgiven through Jesus' death on the cross. And so as we close today, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you've never invited Christ into your life, if you've never said, Jesus, I want to find my identity in you, this is the best moment to do it. And if you've never really seen your identity through Christ, if you've always looked at the environment and you're going to go on another trip or experiences or other people or just yourself for your identity, I tell you what, there is such an amazing life. You're going to find such an amazing sense of freedom when, when, when you get off that rat race of trying to identify yourself by your own accomplishments, by your own accolades. There is such a peace that God has for you that you can't experience in any other way. And today God is inviting you into that peace. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm going to say a simple prayer. And as I pray this prayer, if these words, the words of this prayer express your heart, then, then just at the end of the prayer, you just amen it with me. Amen just means I agree, so be it. And so Heavenly Father, we are, are so thankful for Jesus who came and died for our sins so that we could be set free from our own failures who came so that we could be restored to the identity for which you created us. And today we want to invite Jesus into our lives to, to truly be our God, to be the one who defines us, to be the one in whom we find our identity. So, so Father, we turn away from sin and selfishness and we turn towards you. 
come into my life. Forgive me my, my, of my sins and be my Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.